My name is Elizabeth McIntyre. I'm the co-director of Screencraft Works, and we are an organisation of cross-border mentoring, cross-border talks and cross-border networking. And we have a particular remit to support production and post-production talent that considers themselves underrepresented. With no further ado, I would like to hand to uh, Christopher Chow. Hi, everyone. Firstly, I'll introduce myself. Um, I am Chris Christopher Chow, um, and I am a... Um, a Chinese man in my 40s, so my hair is getting quite gray and I have a, a wear glasses. And uh, I'm a film and TV editor uh, based in London. Hi, my name's Rachel Erskine. I live in Scotland. Um, I am a white female with a short blonde bob. No gray hairs yet, but I'm sure they'll be, I'm sure they'll be coming soon. <laughs> Hi, my name is Soyad Bihan and I am um, a Muslim brown hijabi woman and I am a film and TV editor and a colorist based in Karachi, Pakistan and I have been working in the industry for almost nine years, ten years and I also happen to be one of the very few women editors in Pakistan. Uh, Rachel, would you like to like, uh, tell us about like what you like about editing and how did you get in? Um, so I, I got in um, via an apprenticeship which was really good. I got that through my uh, university that I was studying in and I got a job as an assistant, uh, an apprentice assistant editor. So I went through the um, the route of assistant editor, assembly editor and then finally editor. It was a bit of a long journey but got there in the end. Um, and I, I just, I instantly took to editing. I just loved that it was kind of almost one of the sort of final parts of the puzzle you know everything that comes to you you know technically that's everything that you've got and you just have to make the best out of the best out of what what's there I sort of quickly realized other departments weren't for me I'm not good at organizing other people so that ruled out production um I much prefer being like in a sort of nice setting I don't think I would enjoy being on set all day and it's just I just kind of fell into it the more I've done it I've I've loved it. You know, I loved being an assistant. I loved being an assembly editor. And now I'm absolutely loving being an editor. And I've, I've enjoyed the journey as well. It's been brilliant. How about, how about you, Chris? Um, <clears throat> I kind of, it's weird, like how, how I got in, because I've always thought of myself more like a science person. So I did like a psych psych psychology degree and then, um, one day I just woke up thinking that oh, I want to be a filmmaker and so I went to film school and I feel like that's where my my kind of upbringing merged together the science background and the art where I feel that this is like editing it's where I can do all of that stuff it can be techie and then I can be creative and telling stories and I actually wanted to be a screenwriter but then turns out I'm not as good as screenwriter but I'm better editor which kind of makes sense, like you said, like this yeah. last piece of the puzzle, the last part of the writing. And so it kind of works, uh, works out that way. You just get to and, rewrite the scripts later on. Yeah, exactly. In the edit. Like, especially in documentaries, like uh, I've done some documentaries and like with the amount of footage, you're literally just writing it as you go. Yeah. And so how about you, like Sora? Um, it's interesting, Chris, because I might have a similar story. So I was a pre-med student when I was younger and, but I was always, I was this shy introvert kid, but I loved, uh, you know, uh, drawing and painting. And I remember my dad one time said that, you know, why do you want to pursue medicine? Why don't you go into something that's like, you know, close to what you do, you know, do something that's art related. And so I went to a film school in Pakistan and I did, uh, four years of, uh, filmmaking from there and I really fell in love with the uh, technical side of filmmaking you know whether it be you know shooting with a camera or editing on premiere and so I was really lucky to get an internship right after I got out of film school so I started off as a post-production supervisor and so I got to work with an editor really closely and you know my love for editing you know it just you know it grew by the day and then I was uh, asked to like, you know, I was promoted to a post-production supervisor on that same project. 
And later on, when the lead editor got busy with something, I was asked to like become the second editor on that same film. And I ended up uh, spending a year and a half. And while I was doing that, I also, uh, for the same director, who's also my mentor, I edited a lot of commercials and music videos. So, so even though I had the basics uh, done when I was in film school, a lot of um, the stuff that I learned was on the job. And, you know, and that's, you know, people are always looking for, you know, acquiring a skill set, but you can always learn on the job. That's what I did. Your, your, your dad was so encouraging. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like most parents would really hang on to the, the, free, <laughs> the free medicine, you know. Yeah, my but dad so, was really cool. In that that's way. Like, yeah. No, that's I amazing. think a lot of parents, they, they don't understand what we do, like, uh, like in terms of editing or just anything that is behind the scenes unless you're on screen like an actor <laughs> like they don't care honestly that's amazing my parents did the opposite they were like you should do science <laughs> science <laughs> but um you no know, it's, it's interesting hearing everybody's kind of different journeys like there is no right way to do it and like <laughs> you said i think learning on the job is it's just so much so much better like especially like, nowadays that like, you're so easy to research online and see like watch youtube tutorials so you you will learn while you're on the job and then doing your own kind of uh, research in your free time and learning constantly and yes. then it just keeps getting better and better yes and i think uh one drawback for me was that um i never got a chance to work as an ae as an assistant editor and so while i was asked to work on that film as an editor a lot of times I used to get stuck because I was very creative but my technical knowledge wasn't like that great so there was a lot of trial and error involved in the process and I learned through that you know there were a lot of times when I used to get stuck oh my god what am I going to do but it eventually used to work out but I think that's okay everyone has their own journey but I think for me like whoever's working with me under me I try to like tell them whatever it is that I've learned so that I can make their lives easier because I don't want them to go through the same pain that I went through. I, I didn't start off my career um, as an assistant editor when I started I couldn't get any work I couldn't get any work in post productions, and so I started doing more filming and so I could have something to edit then I got hired as uh, a camera operator making some uh, short documentaries and then I would edit them as well and so then I start building my portfolio. That's amazing though you know just getting yourself out there you couldn't get any editing jobs so you literally sort of created your own. That's amazing. In terms of the internet like like we're talking about like 16, 16 years ago so there were not a lot of jobs being posted online you don't know where to look for work and I didn't know many people like coming out from film school I didn't really know that many people so it took a while to 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 get the momentum oh absolutely <laughs> and like I found as well kind of stepping from role to role you, know, you end up being really established as an assistant editor you know you could be sort of quietly confident that you know work would come but you know, then when you step up to the next role, it's you're not starting again, but you're having to sort of like reinvent yourself in this in this new role and start putting yourself out there again. That's that's one thing that I found found tricky. But if you guys didn't have to do make that that jump, that's perfect. <laughs> but I personally feel that I also missed out on the opportunity of learning from someone experienced and, you know, yeah. learning from their experience, because otherwise I would have avoided being through that trial and error method. You know, sometimes it would just give me a lot of stress. Oh, on the yeah. job if some even if, you know, for, for instance if I'm the only person in my team and there's nobody else to like look up to so I think it has its own benefits but I guess you know it is what it is <laughs> no absolutely even just having somebody else there to bounce ideas off just makes yes. such a difference just some moral support yeah I know it's I've, I've definitely been very fortunate to learn from some very very good editors so I have been lucky and my apprenticeship, I was trained up quite well as an assistant, I feel. So I had a, I had a very good base, which was, which was lucky. Starting in Scotland, there wasn't, too, there wasn't as much work sort of 10 years ago, but now it's kind of, it's looking up as kind of work is moving out of London and more into the regions as well, which has been very good. Yeah, I think that's a really good timing for maybe um, Rachel, like maybe you can 
show your clip and then talk about like how your how you got into the industry at the beginning. So you have to find the three brightest lights there that make the triangle. This one. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Milky Way is. Mm. It's good to get back on the road again, don't you think? But how about just exploring the outer regions of fifth gear? <laughs> I'm on the edge. <laughs> All right. If you had one wish in the world, what would it be? Well, I wish this holiday wouldn't end. <laughs> this was a very important job for me. Uh, this was the first time I was ever sort of hired as an assembly editor on a full job. Previous to this, I'd been hired like for a week or two weeks just to cover people. But this was the first time I was hired to do the whole job. So it was it was very scary. And we were out in the Lake District doing it. And um, it was brilliant. This was the kind of moment where I realized that it's time to try and step up and slowly start to leave the assistant editor work behind, try and get more assembly work and then start progressing towards editing. But I think because I've really enjoyed each job as I've done it, that's why I've taken so long to to move to the next role but I think that's a really important part of the journey I think a lot of people when they're in certain roles are just kind of looking to the next role looking forward all the time instead of kind of enjoying enjoying where you're at but this was a moment where I thought yeah I need to I need to keep pushing and keep keep moving forward with the editing just just for me so that was a that was a very important job for me how do you find like going from like assisting to assembly editing what's the difference that you found well it was very strange having an assistant editor <laughs> um and i found it kind of hard um asking someone else to do things for me just because i i knew so i knew how to do it myself um and yeah it was almost kind of you didn't want to sort of bother anyone or ask ask anyone to do things for you but when the rushes start coming in and you're drowning in scenes soon, you quickly leave that behind and start, you know, asking for support when, when you need it. But it was good. It was just, you have to kind of, you're just thinking of everything in a different way, you know, like you said really nicely earlier, it's kind of like a mix of like science and art. Like the, the assistant editor is very technical, you know, you're making sure everything's set up for the editor. You're also making sure everything's technically okay. And as the assembly editor, you still need to keep an eye on all of this, but you know, your focus is what's been shot. Have they covered the scene? Do we need anything else? Do we have to report back to set? You know, so it's just, it's a bit of a mindset change, which just was, was a good thing for me, for sure. I, I absolutely love the film. I think it's, it's like, well, end of the trailer saying that they wish the journey wouldn't end. I, I feel like I wish the film wouldn't end because it's just such oh. a lovely film. It was a really good experience working on it. I loved it. I really did. So, Raj, do you want to um, introduce your clip and uh, we'll play and watch it? Beat me. Beat me. Beat me. Beat me. Beat me with your fist. Beat me with your feet. Beat me with your voice. And your words. I can take the heat. Can you? Beat me to the top of the mountains. Beat me on the ground. Get to me. Aage bad. Kar ke dekhao. Beat me. Beat me. Beat me. Beat me. Beat me. At life. Ho jai phir. Because I've been waiting to show you, I'm unbeatable. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I think the reason I wanted to show um, this particular clip is because um, it's very true to my editing style, which is very experimental. 
and uh, non-linear uh, and because it's like you know it's also like you know my thought process there's always so much going on in my mind you know so many ideas I just feel that you know when you're working on something you want to make it extremely emotional and impactful and you know I'm always like looking for different approaches like you know how can I make it more impactful how can I make it more emotional so and I think this PSA came out at a time where uh, there was this uh, statement that was released by a group of people back in 2015 2016 like you know where they said that it's okay to beat women slightly and you know women in Pakistan got really offended that what do you mean by that so you know so this PSA was kind of sort of like an answer <laughs> that you know yes beat us but beat us at stuff that we're good at and it's also like kind of I can also relate to it because even when I started off as an editor, I think I did face a lot of discrimination because I'm a woman and, you know, I didn't have a lot of women uh, editors to look up to. And I had my own share of struggles. So like, you know, this particular project, I just gave it my all. <laughs> so, yeah, this is uh, so that's why I wanted to share this clip. Your style is very experimental like in terms of this. What did you experiment on? So we had linear structures as well. But, you know, when I, you know, it's like a lot of jump cuts and, you know, those flashes. And I think this was supposed to be a color. Um, this PSA was supposed to be in color. And then we decided then we'll, we'll make it, uh, I think on edit, we decided that we'll uh, make it black and white. So, yeah, so we were we were doing a lot of uh, things uh, that were not uh, on the storyboard or th that were not on the script. And, you know, I, my director has been very welcoming and he has been very encouraging. He was he was always very encouraging. So, you know, if I had an idea, he would always, go, you know, support it and encourage it. So, yeah, so instead of like going for a linear narrative, we just went a lot. There's a lot of back and forth. If you've seen like, you know, you start with one clip and then you see it later again in the uh, in the segment as well. So, yeah, so like the nonlinear nonlinearity happened later on, on in post. <laughs> It was very impactful and very, Thank very you. well done. I'm, I'm just you. curious, like as as your career has gone on, have you kind of noticed that there's more women in post production, or would you say it's just the same as when you definitely? Started? So, so when I started off, I knew two women who were primarily directors, but I had always heard that they edit their own stuff, so they weren't primarily editors; they were directors. So I didn't have any women editors to look up to, and uh, but then when I started, I think. So recently, I've seen more women coming in the field, and I'm so glad. But I think we still have a long way to go. And, you know, I and that's why I've, I just decided to stick around that maybe it'll inspire more women to enter this field. Because I think there's this idea um, that, you know, I think we all have that, you know, women are not technically sound. Um, and, you know, you and I think I also believed that for a very long time until I went to a film school. Because, you know, because I was shy and because I was an introvert, it was very difficult for me to ask people for help. <laughs> so, you know, what happened was I ended up picking up my own camera. I ended up editing my own stuff and I really enjoyed the process. And I thought to myself, this is possible. This is doable. And then I had to unlearn that whole idea that, you know, no, women can learn technical stuff. I think I'm still more creative and my technical knowledge is not as sound. Uh, but I have become better with time, and I'm, I think we're always learning. Oh, absolutely, no. We're Like we said before, we just have to keep looking forward. Um, and Chris, I'm very curious about what what clip, clip you have to show us. So this is a uh, clip from one of the feature films, an uh, indie feature film I cut a couple of years ago. Um, it was uh, It's called White Colour Black, and it was shown uh, at premiered at the London Film Festival. Uh, and we had a, a second screening on the closing night and both screenings were completely sold out. So it's uh, like it's a absolute one of my proudest work. Thank you. 
specifically this film uh, as a whole, um, it's very interesting because there were maybe like 20, 30 lines of dialogue in the whole film. It's all very visual and quite experimental. And again, it's very low budget, very indie. Uh, the director took a team to um, Senegal and filmed it. I think the first scene is quite an interesting scene where there's only like two, three cameras and then two, three shots. And then you just have to try and create something, um, create a relationship, create a, a, the emotions from it. And then often as editors, we always like cutting dialogues if we're doing like TV or films, but how do you do convey that story without dialogues? Yeah, I think I, I love storytelling with not too much dialogue. Something that um, an editor once told me was that once they've assembled a scene, they watch it back mute just to see what's being conveyed, you know, with the eyes and the emotion and stuff like that. And that's something that I've taken forward and I've, I've started watching things back mute. And, you know, if you're not getting a sense of the emotion with no dialogue, then something's something's not quite right. So... But that was a that was a, a lovely scene scene, Chris. Like it, you can you can tell so much, and like you said, no dialogue. It's no, it's, it's the kind of storytelling that I that I enjoy. It's one of the earlier feature films that I cut, and so it like my style has changed over time as well. And I can imagine like if I go back like to to the same film and then recut it from from scratch, it will be completely different. I think that's what I like the beauty of like editing uh, where every editor would cut things differently and including yourself like if you over time you've changed and then you come back to it and you would do it differently. Adapt to the situation as well like I, I feel like a lot of editors get pigeonholed like oh they only do this they only do that but I think you know a good editor is is able to adapt to any kind of storytelling. People seem to only work in documentary or only work in film. And it's it's a shame because I think people would miss out on the kind of variety of projects. I, I think that's kind of changing a little bit more now. I see a lot more kind of crosses between the genres, which is which is good. Like, I hope that I can sort of work across different genres and different types as well. Like, But it seems like you guys have done, you've both done a little bit of both, I think. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I have done um, documentaries and films and with a bit of commercials and music videos. And I think I'll just add to, you know, that point where you need to adapt to different kinds of stories. I think I learned it the hard way because, you know, initially when I started working and, you know, all the kind of work that my director used to work on, it, it was all very experimental and I used to love working on them. And I remember I was working on this one project. And this person had given it to me and he's like, you know, we just want you to do whatever it is that you like. Um, and I said, okay, sure. So I completely like, you know, sidelined the script. <laughs> and then <laughs> I tried to like come up with something different. And I remember that person looking at that cut and he was a little uh, taken aback. And, uh, you know, he said, thank you. And then he left because, and then I was a little confused. I was like, why did that happen? But then I also realized that, you know, when you're trying to tell somebody else's story as editors, it's our job to like, you know, help the director, you know, tell his vision. And you have to do it their way. And it's something that I learned after a very long time, you know, because I had, I was really lucky, very fortunate to have a director who, whose style suited, you know, my, you know, whose uh, narrative style was very similar to like, you know, my narrative sense. Uh, I think I wasn't really open to like experimenting with like, you know, the linear uh, side of, uh, you know, narrative filmmaking. But I think I was later on, I learned and then I think, you know, it's, you should always be open to like experiment with different story, uh, you know, storytelling styles. But what about, because um, like, I, I, I was born in Hong Kong and I grew up watching a lot of Hong Kong films and at the same time of American, American films. So I feel like I, I, I get a lot of influences from kind of the Western and then also the Asian culture. Then I grew up here and then started watching more Japanese films as well. And then they they have a different style, like you you know like you, you, when you watch a film it doesn't matter like what the people look like you know the filmmakers they are different they are from different background different culture. I worked on a film called A House in Jerusalem, which was shot entirely in Palestine, 
that was you know an area that I didn't really know too much about and I wasn't really sure if like the style was going to be different or if the way things were approached were different and I just kind of did my research like on the area and stuff um beforehand and I think that kind of helped me kind of understand the culture a little bit more as well and I think if you're working on something like that you just have to be honest and if there's something that maybe doesn't land with you or you're not sure just ask the people who who, who are there you know I personally think that you know I think we I think our emotions really drive the story and I think that's what we connect with it doesn't matter where the film is from so it's like for instance if you're watching a separation from Iran or you're watching in the mood for love you know there are you 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 don't know the language but even if you watch the film there's something that they make you feel something and I think emotions come into play and I think when the cultures I think you the influence is there but I think it's the emotion that derives the narrative and for me I think that sort of I think that is where the connection comes from. Do you think there is a reason for certain style from um, different cultures as, as an example like if you specifically watch like Japanese films a lot of them are either very intense octane kind of crazy editing and then or like everything's like really slow really dragged on and I never quite understand why there's a, such a distinctive style yeah I'm not sure what drives that actually like you know, it's a, it's a very good point, something I've never really thought about much before. I suppose it's one of these things that if if there's a, you know, a film from a certain region or country that's a success, like I wonder if people just, other filmmakers and editors maybe just mimic the style and then it just becomes becomes a kind of common, common trait. Zora, would you like to uh, introduce your next clip? I'll just give a brief intro about this documentary. This documentary uh, I worked on with a very dear friend of mine last year, and it's about climate change and you know how people who have been living in those areas that are like uh, that are affected by climate change and floods, um, how it affects their livelihoods and not just uh, you know it also affects them mentally. And this little sequence I remember was a very important one because when I was listening about this in, um, sequence on the interview in the interviews, um, the character talks about you know how they are always you know looking out for like you know uh, you know disasters you know and they're trying to minimize uh, you know casualties and you know so for example if there is a, there are chances of a flood or an avalanche they have to evacuate right away so there are a bunch of people who are always looking out during the night. But for this particular sequence, I didn't have enough footage. There was no footage at all. Um, the only footage that I had was the one with you know people with the torchlight, and I and I felt that you know this is a very important sequence for the film. How can I you know make it work? And I think after like a couple of days, uh, you know, I then realized that you know I have a lot of B roll that's there, and it was like you know footage from you know it was like daylight footage, and I was like maybe I can make it work with a bit of sound design and you know you know, you, you know, you day for night kind of, uh, you know, use, you know, graded in a way that it's like day for night footage. And that's what I did. And my, my director was really happy. And she was like, you know, you made it work. I was like, yeah. So I think, you know, as editors, most of the times we have to have that, you know, solution oriented approach. We always need to like look for solutions because, you know, sometimes you will not have enough stuff and you need to figure out, you know, how can you make it work with the limited footage or, you know, material that you have. हम इस एरिया में 50 सालों से ले रहे हैं फर्ज करें कि मौसम अचानक खराब हो गया है तो इसमें हमें पता है कि अगर आइंदा 48 या 72 घंटे तक ये मौसम इसी तरह से खराब रहे तो इस नाले से सैलाब आने के चांसेस है या सर्दियों में एवलांच का खतरा है मैं ऐसे सिचुएशन में एक तरह से के गांव के जो नौजवान से उनको एक तरह से एक ड्यूटी दी हुई थी तो उसको रात को टार्च लेके एक रखाली करनी पड़ती है कि भाई अगर वहां से रात फल हो तो हम घर वालों को बता सके या सैलाब आ रहा है या अगर एवलांस का खतरा हो तो हम घर वालों को बता सके भाई आवाजें आने लगी आप घर से बाहर निकले
you would never know that most of that was just b-roll like it looked it looked it all looked very intentional thank you do you sort of seek out projects that are like important topics for you or do you, has it just kind of happened that way? I think I've just been very lucky because I think um, the kind of people who come to me, I know, I think they kind of know kind what kind of projects appeal to me. So I think that's the kind of project that I get. I think I've just been very fortunate. I've only, I've only done scripted. So I feel like a lot of, I mean, nothing has a more powerful message really than a, than a documentary. It's, I'd love to I'd love to watch that one. I on the other hand I started with scripted and I did 4 years of scripted and then I switched to documentary and I I think I personally never thought I would get into documentary editing. I wasn't really fond of documentary editing. I didn't like it very much, but I think 5 years later when I started doing it I was like, "Oh, I absolutely love documentary editing." And you know, here I am. I'm doing a little bit of both. Do you have a preference? Uh not really. I think if you had asked me this question like a couple of years ago, I would have definitely said scripted. But I think I I absolutely enjoy both of them now. Depends on the story, okay. doesn't it? I imagine like for sure, it's definitely the story. Like I can imagine, there's nothing more like powerful than working on a topic which is really like important to you personally. Yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think like um, you know, people often talk about you don't know what the editors people don't can't really tell what's good editing because you don't know what they went through behind the scenes to make that scene work make that film work and like what you just like talked about how you made that and taking the on the challenge of doing something that wasn't there and then creating it i think that's just magic casualty 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 This is DCI Amy Silver. Earlier today, crewman died on board vigil. How are you with confined spaces? I'm going to need someone who can radio me leads. I was also the assembly God, editor John, on, on this job as well, and I chose this clip because it's so different to Supernova. As you can see, it's a, it's a TV drama, so you have to think about other episodes and what, what other editors are dealing with as well and think of it as a whole a whole piece rather than well, a whole section of pieces rather than just one contained film. Definitely not as emotional as Supernova, so, you know, a different cutting style. Was, this, this job was all about kind of looks, red herrings, suspicion, which was, which was great. Like, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that as well, but very different style, and you just, you just adapt to it. What I'm doing lately now is more, more for TV, because it's taken me a long time to get to now being editing for TV. Again, it's the same thing at the beginning where I couldn't get into TV. It's just impossible. Like it's always like you always have to have your first job in order to get the second one. But if you never manage to get your first step in there, you can't get in. And so, uh, I so a couple of years ago, um, I stepped down um, as an assistant to work on a, a TV show. And then that allowed me to then continue working for several, a, few, a couple more uh, TV shows in, in UK. And then finally last year, I was able to get an agent and then started getting work for TV. No, I think it's very interesting because I feel, you know, when we're talking about influences and, you know, cutting styles, I think some, most of the times it's the story that dictates the style of, you know, uh, on the editing table. And, you know, the, what's the best way to tell a particular story? It's, it's great that you weren't afraid to, I don't like using the term like step down, but, you know, step to the side and into another role in order to sort of get to where you want to be. Like, I think that's very admirable. Like a lot of people wouldn't want to do that. And I think it's, I think it's a, a brilliant way to, to approach things. And I know a few other people who've sort of managed to do that as well, just work as an assistant editor for a few years to get those connections to then be able to step step back up to to edit I'm glad that 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 worked out for you yeah luckily <laughs> but <laughs> I was kind of like it, it because I, I kind of got to a point where I was rather kind of depressed like my career wasn't really progressing the way it, it was and then uh, and also a couple of jobs uh, uh, fell through and so that was the point where I knew I had to change, I had to do something else. And again, like it was purely by chance that 
um, <clears throat> a job that came up and they were looking for an assistant who had drama experience. It was a documentary, but they were looking for drama experience. And so I had both. And then that, that's why I managed to get the job. I might have a question, Chris. Do you think getting an agent helped you with getting like, you know, better projects? Because that's something that I've been hearing a lot. Like even people in US, um, they have agents because this is something we don't have in Pakistan. Uh, yes, definitely. Oh, I think in, in UK, um, if, I think if you have not had a lot of experiences or you don't have a lot of credits, you really need an agent in order for productions to take you more seriously. Hello, conversationalists. Um, I'm just uh, popping back in to continue it with a few questions that we're um, getting through from the um, audience. Do you think that working virtually on a project, if you're working on an international project, for example, does that help with an understanding of different cultures and how we might um, perceive each other's cultures? Is that is that helpful when there are those virtual connections between international teams? I think certainly the virtual aspect has opened more doors to people, you know, working, working internationally and with different cultures and that kind of thing, like um, just going back to a house in Jerusalem that was done entirely remote, and I don't think I don't think it hindered the final the final product at all. It maybe hindered the speed a little bit. <laughs> we could have maybe shaved a week or two off the edit, maybe if we'd been in the room. But um, I think you know when you connect on a project like the sort of any kind of cultural barrier kind of just 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 goes away. <laughs> How does it work when editing only some episodes of a of a television series? How do you maintain a consistency between the editors? Edit two, uh, one two episodes of Casualty uh, last year, and that was like uh, the whole like it's the whole series. The series is about like thirty something episodes, and there were many many editors who were uh, working on it, and that's the first time I experienced how all of that worked out. And we were helping each other out in terms of like behind the scenes, whether we needed something or we were having questions about like certain characters, uh, because obviously we don't know what happens before uh, after, and we don't have the scripts for them. And so it's just, you're just focusing on your own episode. But um, the execs, the producers, they were really, really clear. Like uh, for example, like this one scene where I was using like close-ups uh, because it's a very intense scene. I was using close-ups, but then the producer came back after viewing and said that maybe we need to hold back. Uh, uh, don't use a close-up there because the character's journey is not over yet. There's further for him to, to, to for his emotions to go in the future episodes. So we want to just keep it uh, uh, back a little bit. And that was very interesting that I didn't think like, okay, now I'm actually, I'm really part of the, a bigger team and they, uh, what I do affects them, they affect me. Yeah, that was fascinating. What is the difference in workflows when you are working on documentaries and fiction? Um, that's a very good question. So I remember when I uh, switched from um, scripted uh, content to documentaries, I remember when I was given footage and I was told that, you know, this is the footage and you have to come up with a narrative on the you know on the timeline and I think that for me was a little nerve-wracking in, in the beginning uh, I think the workflow itself is like pretty similar however for documentaries you don't really have a script and also you have to like you know sometimes there's a paper edit that you are given um, by the producers and directors but most of the time you are the one who are rewrite you're the you're rewriting the story on the edit and you know you're going through a lot of transcriptions uh, that are provided to you. And I think, uh, you know, it's always, uh, it's interesting that, you know, you're trying to like coming up with a narrative as you go. And, you know, when you, with the scripts, you have everything there. So you just have to like put it on the timeline, but with uh, documentaries, it's like, you know, you're figuring things out. You just put everything and then you try to find a narrative within all the material that you have. I worked on, in documentaries where they were, we had paper edits and then also the ones that happened. And I think like I enjoyed um, starting with a paper edit because I know like what I'm looking for. And then also knowing that things can change. 
uh, drastically. Like, uh, like you can, especially like with documentaries, you're constantly discovering like material. You, you're always like looking for stories. And then sometimes what someone else is, sees might not be what you think. And then some, you might find something that is really interesting, fascinating. And then, but people don't, like, they, they forget about it. And then, so you start rebuilding a whole storyline that works with everything else. Because like in the same way, I think with scripted and documentaries is that as an editor, you need complete understanding of the entire story. And it feels like a whole network of all of these story points, emotions, and how do they work together seamlessly and enhancing each other. And from that aspect, I think it's exactly the same. I agree. And I think I remember one editor uh, mentioning this uh, somewhere and he said, you know, always go for, you know, emotion before information. You need to make sure how the audience feels about, you know, you know, whatever sequence it is that that's there, you know, and he said that, you know, whenever you're going through the footage, make sure like make notes of, you know, how a certain footage or a clip made you feel. And, you know, that might, you know, really help, you know, put, you know, it might move the audience. So yeah, that was, I think that for me was a very useful advice. How do you change your approach in the edit suite when you go from assistant to editor? I mean, how do you read the room as an assistant? How do you then read the room as an editor? What are those key differences um, within the role tonally? Um, I, I'm very fascinated with any job actually, when you go from <laughs> one position to another and how you reinvent yourself, how you reposition yourself. It's a very interesting topic to get that right. Yeah, so one thing that I had to kind of focus on was just not jumping back into the old role because I could do it. You know, if something would come up, I would just be like, oh, I, I can do that. And I'm like, no, 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 I can do that. But there is somebody else who can also do that. So I had to get really used to kind of sort of dele delegating tasks to the assistant editor because you want people to see you editing they don't want you don't want them to see you you know assisting assisting yourself kind of thing um and yeah I just this is something that I kind of was speaking to my mentor about is you know making sure you're acting like the the head of department role that you're in and I think it's just embracing it because as an editor, people come to you with questions, you know, the producer comes to you with questions, the director, and as an assistant, when these questions would come to you, some, if I couldn't answer them, I'd immediately be like, oh, I'll just go and ask the editor, you know, I'll go and get that answer for you. And, you know, now they, you know, they come to you and you just, you just have to embrace it. You know, people are looking to you for advice as the head of department and, you know, every you know, we've all came up through different training and backgrounds and stuff, but we all we all know it. And I think you just have to sort of be confident and just 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 embrace it, really. And Sorat, obviously your your route, um uh you, you've spoken about um having to learn on YouTube, um, that it was very difficult for you to enter the industry as a woman when um predominantly men weren't um supporting you. <clears throat> So you were self-taught as well as college um, and then um, on, on the job. So how did you find going up the ladder? Um, was it different from Rachel's experience? I think for me, it was very interesting. Uh, I think it happened very naturally to me because, uh, for me because uh, when I uh, was working uh, at this my previous place and I had worked for them for like four years and then, and then I felt that, you know, things had become really stagnant and I had learned a lot from them, but I think it was time for me to move on. And then, then I got a call from my, uh, my second boss and she wanted me to come in and she, and I, when I was working on my previous job, I was single-handedly working, uh, you know, handling the uh, post-production department. I had a, one friend who used to help me every now and then, but then when I went um, to my, you know, to the other job, they had an entire edit team and she wanted me to come in as a senior editor. And that for me, I didn't realize that, you know, even I forgot at one point that I am coming with an amount of experience. At that time, I had worked in the industry for like good four or five years. And then, you know, it took me time to like, just get used to it that, you know, uh, because when 
I went in there and I, you know, I used to work on projects and there were a lot of times when we had technical issues and I knew the answer because, you know, I had faced it before and I was like, oh, you know, we, that's not a problem. You know, we just fix it this way. And then, you know, then I realized that, you know, if I have been given this opportunity to lead a team, it's because, you know, I have worked in the industry for so far and, you know, I have, I come with an experience and sometimes it's just like, you know, you have to like tell yourself that, you know, you have earned it. You have worked long enough to earn the role of the head of a department, for instance. And you also be willing to help and also don't be shy of like asking for help if you're like, get, if you get stuck at some place and you know it doesn't matter if you're the head of the department i have had amazing uh editors junior editors working for me who have like you know helping me with, with stuff for instance if i got stuck somewhere they would like come up with a solution i was like oh thank you so much i had no idea that this was possible i i like that very much and i think that's you know we're learning and uh teaching throughout our entire careers aren't we i i have to say yes. if your passion and dream is to become a, a an editor there are a number of routes to achieve that and then continue to grow and learn. And, and that's so vital when people can feel frustrated if they don't feel that they are managing to achieve that um, ambition. I think like, well, uh, on that point with, um, sorry, uh, what you were talking about earlier, that there were, are, are very few women uh, in, in Pakistan who are edit editors. And I think like in, in like for example, in UK, there are very few East Asians who look like me who are editors in post production, and so that's why I I founded the the Beam Network to connect more uh, people from my background who work together to support each other because I think it's it's near impossible to be doing it by yourself if you are not like majority of people who are out there working, and so you have to work together with each other and support each other and that's really it's really important uh, i agree um so that's a b a, a b e a m could you give the um the uh, website details for um people to be able to contact would that be yeah i think uh if i remember correctly i think it's we are beam.network so how do you build a portfolio of work in order to get experiences and ed editors when you don't know any directors? So you want to showcase your work in order to get that foot in the door. I don't have an awful lot to show for my editing, um, even though I now have sort of two feature film credits. Um, because they're not out yet, I have, I have nothing to show. And I, a lot of people go down the short film route and edit an awful lot of short films and you can use that as your portfolio but I sort of didn't I, I really focused on the assembly editor uh, work but that means that the final edit's not yours so again you can't really put that on your on your portfolio I would I would say like try and join you know groups in your area like there's lots of Facebook groups you can join for filmmakers and start putting yourself out there as an editor because even though you're an editor who doesn't know any directors, there'll be plenty of directors who don't know any editors. So I think it's just trying to immerse yourself in those in those groups, whether it's in person or online. In Scotland, there's a Scottish filmmakers Facebook group and all, all sorts of other ones, Assistant Editors London, all these kind of groups, I would say, get on there and say that you're willing to willing to edit for people, and hopefully you'll get some hits. How can you get a foot in the door as a remote editor if you have no direct uh, TV and film experience? When I did a lot of corporate videos um, and like com uh, commercial work, most of it was on uh, like remote. I was editing from home. They would send you a drive, and then so you I could have been anywhere. The only downside was that you have to be close enough so they can send you a drive cheaply. That's the only only downside as a, like remote editors in terms of commercial space. For TV and films, it's different. Like you can work certain amount remotely and then until people start, they just want to see you. I think I'll just add to it because I think I was attending a conference a couple of, uh, like some time ago and this editor said that, you know, uh, I think more than your resumes and your portfolios, I think word of mouth uh, works the most because, you know, people need to know that they they are able to trust you 
And, you know, so I think there are all these sessions and conferences happening all the time, you know, by American cinema editors, British film editors, you know, you can always go online. There's, you know, there's, there are these seminars that had happened by the name of like Sight and Sound. So you can always go online and, you know, just network with people, let them know. And by, till that time, till you have time, you can work on your skills, learn Premiere, learn Avid, you know, now you have, you can learn all these skills on LinkedIn. So while you have that time, work on your skills and, you know, just, just reach out to people because people are, they respond like, you know, but I think you will have to like keep reaching out to people <laughs> Because, you know, everyone is so busy, but, you know, you never know. One of them might just, like, respond and you're like, yeah, I have, and you know, I have, you know, perhaps you can come in as an editor, as an apprentice, and, you know, and then you can work your way up. How did you find work as an assistant editor working on film and TV drama? Was it through word of mouth, picking up on that theme, um, emailing lots of people? Um, how did you progress? Um, did, it, did it make you feel nervous when making the jump to assembly editing? So I think that is for you, Rachel, but it's reflecting the, those themes of um, yeah, yeah. capacity and word of mouth. Yeah, a lot of it is word of mouth. So I was really fortunate that the first job that I managed to get onto was a, a sort of school <laughs> drama called Waterloo Road. And what's really good about a setup like that is that there's so many editors. It's kind of like what um, Chris was talking about earlier with casualty. It's really good to try and get in somewhere where you'll meet, you know, five eight editors and and directors so and it's quite a fast turnaround so I kind of met a lot of editors very quickly that way and I was like really fortunate that, like, that one or two of them were willing to pop with me again and take me on to some other projects and um in the beginning it was hard like there was times where I couldn't get any work um and I did I just kept sort of trying to keep in touch with people you know being willing to do, you know, one, two days cover at short notice, the night shift, the dreaded night shift, you know, all of these things. And um, I definitely was scared making the jump to assembly editor because I was so comfortable as an assistant editor. I was in my element. Um, most things that came my way, one way or another, would be able to sort them. And I, I enjoyed the job. And yeah, I was I was definitely very nervous when when I made the jump. But I think I think a bit of nerves is good for you sometimes. You don't want to get too comfortable, which I definitely was. I think reach out to other editors because you know I think editing is more of a community. You're not competitors. You're more of a community. So you know because I had at one point I had like one man who denied me the mentor. You know he denied me the mentorship, but. I had other amazing male friends who would just like help me out. You know, they were just always a call or a text away. And or even my mentor, my director who gave me the opportunity. So, you know, it's like always reach out to other people, other co-editors and, you know, learn from each other's experiences. And you never know. Sometimes, you know, for instance, if you're, you're not available, you can always, you know, send the work to somebody else's way. Help out each other. I found like the editing community, it's, probably the most friendly and supportive uh, community uh, out there in, in the film filmmaking uh, world. And everyone's online, they're very supportive. And I think that's, like I said earlier, you can't make it by yourself. You have to be part of a community. You, you need that support. And then in turn, you will give that support to someone else. And so that, like that for me, definitely go, go out there on, on online, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and reach out to people and exist. You have to exist in that space for, for other people to know you exist. And so then, even though you might even talk about like virtual uh, uh, working, because you they know you through your internet uh, presence, then you might get some work through there. You never know. I would say enjoy the stage that you're at now, <laughs> even though you know, everyone's looking forward to, you know, even if you're not in the dream job, you know, just try and take, try and take the good from it. Because I think if people see you in that kind of positive way, they're more likely to try and help you make, make the next step. That's a, that's a wonderful note to end on, but thank you very much indeed for attending this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.